This is Steve Fowkes welcoming you to the ninth and final mini video for this presentation series. This part will provide practical information about testing options for tracking mental changes to either recognize declining cognitive functions while you still have the time to do something about it personally or to ascertain efficacy for dietary, nutritional, or drug interventions for reversing Alzheimer's disease in another person. Neuropsychological assessment services are available by medical referral or through independent contracting. These tests of such things as IQ, memory, decision-making ability, motor control function, reaction time, proprioception, and sensory discrimination are administered by trained professionals and are likely to be the most accurate assessments possible, although they will tend to be infrequent for obvious financial reasons. At-home testing offers an affordable alternative to the high cost of medical testing. Computer games are an excellent option. Computer games are cheap and computer systems are common in many households. There are many games to choose from, but the best data will be from games with a cascade failure type of design in which the game gets progressively more challenging over time and the challenge increases with each mistake. Any computer game with this design will probably work well. In addition, there are now many newer brain challenge software systems that are designed to measure and improve mental functions of many kinds. There are other tests that you can do at home. For example, the game of concentration tests short and medium term memory with a deck of playing cards and a stopwatch. The shuffled cards are spread out on the table face down and the player turns them over two at a time to try to pair them up. With pairing, the cards are removed from the table. With non-pairing, the cards are turned back face down. The better you can remember the cards you have seen and where they were positioned, the faster you can make pairs and clear the table. The faster your time, the better your memory. And maybe the better your dexterity of turning cards. If the test takes too long, just use face cards. Self-administered proprioception tests or family-assisted proprioception tests can indicate cognitive function. This is a variation of the walk the line and finger to the nose tests for drunk drivers, but you systematically test your ability to know where your body parts are without using your eyes. Measure how close you get with straightforward posture, sitting up straight, and with abnormal posture, leaning to the side, twisted at the waist, touching your nose with your elbow over your head, etc. Sometimes there are daily or weekly activities that you can do that can be adapted for cognitive assessment. For example, maybe you play duplicate bridge with a regular partner and your status in the ranking can give you data on your cognitive abilities. Maybe you play chess regularly or juggle. With Parkinson's disease, handwriting gets smaller. Handwriting may change in other ways that can be easily seen to correlate with motor control skills and visual feedback processing. If you do the New York Times Daily Crossword Puzzle, you might plot how long it takes you to solve it using a different pen color for each day of the week. There are two compelling reasons for daily at-home testing. First, it is empowering. It combats feelings of helplessness, which would otherwise undermine any therapeutic regimen. Second, daily testing provides a high bandwidth of data so that you can make judgments about the efficacy of an intervention in about a week to maybe a month, depending upon how you do it and how it works. With semi-annual assessments by a neuropsychologist, it can take a year to effectively evaluate an intervention. In my opinion, the most important factor for at-home testing is compliance. So try to find tests that are fun, or at least are not tediously boring. Thank you for listening. If you wish to make use of this contact information, you can pause the playback now. Or you can let the video play on and watch the last two supplementary slides on controversial dental-related risk factors 
which were optional materials in the original presentation, but are included here for viewers who want the extra information. In this experiment, the amount of mercury needed to inhibit GTP binding by beta tubulin was measured. The results are the magenta curve. At 0.625 micromolar mercury, the inhibition of GTP binding was about 4%, which is fairly low. But double that to 1.25 micromolar, the inhibition rises to 25%. Double it again, and the inhibition rises to 60%. Double that mercury again to 5 micromolar, and the inhibition hits 85%. Most of the enzyme activity is gone. The blue curve is the GTP binding curve for zinc exposure. At the low concentrations that produce 4% inhibition with mercury, there is no inhibition with zinc. The zinc concentration has to be 16 times higher to have a 15% inhibition effect, and it has to be 32 times higher to have a 28% inhibition effect. At equal concentrations, mercury would achieve 100% inhibition. But when the zinc was added to the mercury, there was a greater than additive effect. With 10 micromolar zinc, which produces 15% inhibition on its own, the beta tubulin binding of GTP went from 4% to 50% at the lowest concentration. With 20 micromolar zinc, the inhibition went from 4% to 75%. This indicates that zinc has the potential to aggravate mercury toxicity, particularly at its lowest concentrations, where it is borderline toxic. The reason for this may be found in an especially close relationship between zinc and mercury. On the periodic table, mercury lies immediately below zinc, which makes them isoelectronic, meaning that they have the same number of outer electrons or a similar kind of chemical character. If so, this would suggest that cadmium might also exhibit similar toxicity and synergy. It might be a wise thing to assess both mercury and cadmium exposure as a routine clinical assessment for Alzheimer's patients. The ability of infected root canal teeth to inhibit beta tubulin binding of GTP has been measured directly although the precise structure of the inhibiting agent or agents has not been determined it is known that anaerobic bacteria are capable of making gliotoxin which irreversibly binds to sulfhydryl enzyme sites as illustrated the source of sulfur for synthesis of gliotoxin may be through degradation of methionine and cysteine into low molecular weight sulfur compounds the traditional method for root canals uses gutta percha as a filling agent. This is a highly viscous material which cannot penetrate into the hollow tubules which radiate from the core of the tooth where the nerve is located to the periphery of the tooth where the enamel is located. Prior to a root canal, these hollow tubules provide access for white blood cells to perform immune maintenance to keep the tooth sterile. After the root canal with gutta percha, these tubules are isolated from any immune system access. Anaerobic bacteria can take up residence and proliferate. There are more innovative root canal methods that use ozone gas to sterilize the tooth tubules of infected teeth and calcium oxide slurries to fill the teeth, which allows the migration of calcium into the tubules and the formation of a cement-like filling to fill or at least partially fill the tubules. This is the end of part nine. Thank you for listening to the entire presentation. My congratulations on your stamina. You've just digested roughly a decade of literature research in a little more than an hour. So do not be concerned if you feel more than a bit overwhelmed. If you have somebody in your life that you love who has Alzheimer's disease, Please accept my best wishes on your therapeutic success, and please do not hesitate to let me know your results.